G'day everyone and welcome to another episode of the CX Matters Podcast. My name is Justin Tippett and in this episode I have a very special guest, Karen Clydesdale, who is the Head of Customer Experience and a couple of other things on your title for Tennis Australia. Welcome Karen, or should I say KC, as you are much better known. Thanks Justin. Yes, no, I certainly do prefer KC, especially off the back of COVID. Um, Karen got a bit of a reputation that I don't like to be labelled with. Yeah, I tell you what, I do feel a bit rough for people who call Karen, right? (laughs) Because uh, all of a sudden it's got this connotation with it, right? So uh, we will stick with KC, I promise you. Um, Now, look, there's so much that we can unpack. Obviously, heading up customer experience for for Tennis Australia, there's about a billion things that we can talk about and we're going to cover some of those in, in this podcast. But before we get into that, that stuff. I just want to talk about you and your career, Karen, because, you know, there's a lot of people that are sort of, we're starting to learn, have had careers in either contact centers or customer experience. And uh, for me, I'd love sharing those stories because you get so many people that start at, you know, grass level, if you like, and don't see the bigger picture that this could lead to some pretty cool jobs. And I reckon head of uh, customer experience for Tennis Australia is tick for cool jobs, right? So how did it all start for you, Karen? Oh, uh, yeah, no, and it is. I'm very fortunate. I've got a great job. I love what I do. Um, so what started, I initially wanted to help people. So um, I became a nurse um, and loved doing that. Um, so obviously, have, I feel like I have that empathy and caring for people. But I think thinking about it, I really wanted to do something a little bit bigger and, well, not bigger, but something a little bit different than that. And I always wanted to work in sport. So I went back and uh, studied and worked in the sporting area, then worked with um, homeless men and set up um, what we called RecLink. Wow. And then started working with Tennis Australia in a role with Tennis for People with Disabilities. And from there, many roles have opened up and all of those doors opened. I was always really conscious, obviously, of the customer, whether that was the clubs, whether it was our coaches, I'm working in the participation side of things. We brought in cardio tennis, we set up coach membership, and that was all about providing a really great service for our coach members who you know, are the forefront of our, of our sport. And then I was fortunate enough to then get involved with our customer support team, led that through a crisis um, when a few things went a little bit pear-shaped. And then from there, there was an opportunity to take that enterprise wide, not just a vertical within the business. Um, that was just customer support. Then we did a digital and tech review about four or five years ago. And that was an opportunity to really bring in human-centered design, which is one of our, you know, our key pillars in our CX team, which is really, you know, providing, um, you know, really great experiences, um, memorable experiences end-to-end uh, for all our customers. So, yeah, I'm very fortunate. Yeah, absolutely. And I look forward to unpacking the, the human centered design stuff in this podcast. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, uh, in the future. And, and you're right. I mean, you, you, as you said, you started as a nurse and you ticked the empathy box and you've always had that focus for customers. What, what sort of drives you, Karen? Because, you know, is that something you think is inbuilt with people that they've got it? Or is that something that you've, you've learnt over time? Or have you just always yeah. from day one sort of gone, no, I, I always think about the customer? Yeah, no, it's interesting. I certainly probably a lot more than I did, but I think it was it was probably innate and um, probably that caring factor and really wanting to make um, a difference and also like really wanting to improve anything we did um, to improve that yeah, continuous improvement. So I think that's probably been the underlying factor. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly over the last four or probably even six to seven years, I've found really good mentors. Um, I've aligned myself with a range of different organisations and networked as obviously how I've met you. Yeah, well, well it's ex- exactly right. Well, when we met through LinkedIn, right? So it's, a, it's obviously a really good platform for connecting professionals in different industries. So so if someone's starting out, and, and obviously when you started and, and when I started, CX wasn't even a thing, it literally didn't even exist, right? When, you know, we had call centers, sure, but, um, you know, CX is, is certainly an emerging profession. It, like how, how would someone today, I mean, you've got a team obviously now, and we'll, again, we'll talk about that, but like how does someone get started in, in CX now at, at a Ten Australia, a Tennis Australia as an example? And I think it's interesting talking to other CX professionals. People come from so many different backgrounds, whether that is a digital background, whether it's a marketing background, or whether it's someone like myself who's actually come through the actual sport or through the actual industry and then understands the industry and then um, gets exposed to CX or self-taught, so to speak. So yep. I think there are so many different ways to enter. A couple of our experienced designers have actually come through our business and through our um, customer support team because they've shown that um, you know potential. And we've obviously done a lot of uplift within the business. Otherwise, we've also gone out and sought capability, which we needed to do because we didn't have that capability. So we've got some amazing experienced designers, senior experienced designers um, with a lot of UI, UX, um, but certainly, um, yeah, they've come with great digital backgrounds in particular. 
Yeah, fantastic. All right, well, let's um, let's start talking about all things Tennis Australia. And um, if you are listening to this podcast, uh, we are going to make reference to a couple of slides. If you're watching it, you'll get to see some of those slides. But for all AXPA members, uh, you can download the full slide deck that uh, Karen's going to be referring to. And there's some fantastic information in those slide decks, just how they're positioned things and audience insights and demographics and you name it, right? So it's a great deck. So uh, if you are interested in that, make sure you uh, log into your membership portal. If you haven't got one, buy one. Um, all right, so Karen, um, Tennis Australia, I guess it all starts with a vision. Um, and so can you sort of share us with, I guess, the, the whole CX journey and start with, you know, what is the vision for Tennis Australia and how do you play into that? Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that was one of the first things from a Tennis Australia perspective, um, you know, really needed to align to our business. So what are we there to do? Um, and I think we may have a little slide for, which can make it easier for me as well. But, um, and also for those that are listening, but certainly we are here to create memorable customer ex um, experiences, catering for all our segment needs. Um, and what does that mean? Because we've got so many different segments. Um, but if we just go to, yeah, that's the one, if you stick on that one, that aligning with our strategy, our business strategy, um, we're here to really create an overall vision for tennis and really creating it a playful world. And I think that's the key is, aren't we lucky to be in a, in a sport that you can play from um, cradle to grave? But it's about growing the AO um, and then that AO can really inspire people to play and we can really um, generate more future champions and generate that profit, which will then go into growing participation get more fan base and create that talent pipeline and all those people can be playing out there through our clubs um, or in our schools um, and through all our coaches and then really to grow and develop champions which is obviously an opportunity to produce some local heroes and um, and really drive more people to play the game so that's sort of um, little our um, our wheel of yeah, um, yeah. how it works. Great insight. And I, I remember, and, and again, thank you for inviting me uh, back in Tennis Australia. Um, earlier on, I got to meet some of some of your team and the broader team. But I remember talking about local heroes and just how much of an impact that really has on on ratings and attendance and, uh, and et cetera. It was, it was quite quite the insight, right? Certainly. And um, look, we all love Ash Barty and, and uh, certainly been involved with the sport for so long. Um, loved her the fact that she won in 22 but um i would have really loved her to play for a few more years because that would have made our role as cx <laughs> and so much easier but um, I, I, obviously I you know, respect her decision yeah do you reckon uh, completely nothing to do with cx do you reckon we'll see her back one day do you reckon she's actually done she's done she's done there you go all right um fantastic all right so so you've so you've got the vision for tennis australia and as you said you know, we shared that slide to to, to grow the game etc develop championships uh champions and get participation going how do you then tie that into a customer experience strategy yes certainly so then what we have done we've really aligned understanding what the strategy is and then what at what we're trying to achieve and then align that with the people in the business and then that's really what we then did next was really we recruited and built a team um, and yep, that was yep. really important to do that so um, now we've got a team that oversees both the events and participation side of the business um, and as I mentioned before we assembled you know those capabilities um, to, to build the people within the business but also externally as well um, and um, and then we align small teams so for example we have a team that are working on the app and the web and um, the AO app and the web and ticketing end to end and all the patron comms end to end. And there's a team of about four or five experienced designers who do that. Um, and then we have a team also that are working within the precinct and workforce. And we've only just made a decision um, now because they've evolved so well and there seems to be that readiness and maturity. So we've actually stepped up and popped a couple of our team members within and embedded them within a team, um, which I think is going to be really interesting to see how that goes. So we'll have our core team, but then starting to embed where there's that maturity um, as we've evolved. Yep, and, and I guess probably one of the questions I should have asked earlier on, how big is the team in total, like we, we're around customer experience, roughly? Yeah, and no, it's interesting you say, because we sort of scale up and scale down. So course, we have a customer yeah, yeah. support team um, yep. all year round, around 10 12 um, some of those are casuals of course and then we also have um, our experienced designers so we've got about 12 full-timers well wow. okay there you go um, fantastic all right so if I um, if you're looking at the slides we go back and so you've got your various teams that are focusing on different things now I know from previous conversations you know you, your CX is is physical and digital right where mm. it, can you sort of talk us through a little bit about the differences? I mean, obviously some of it makes sense, but there's, there's some clearly digital, I guess, is a really growing space for a lot of businesses, right? 
Certainly, certainly. And um, we, it always is, CX is obviously that end-to-end -end and it's some of all those interactions. And if you're coming to the Australian Open, you're obviously, hopefully, you're seeing it all, all on our, um, our advertising and our promotions through all our different channels, whether that be our web or whether it's through our television and um, all, all our digital media as well, of course. So, and then there's an opportunity for you actually to, to buy online, which is obviously a digital experience. But then you actually come to the tennis and you come to the event and you come through an entrance and you see people and that is obviously a very physical experience but that's waiting in queues and of course you watch the tennis which is a physical experience but as we know you can be watching and also using your digital um, whether that be a phone or a, a tablet and experiencing the tennis digitally as well so um, and using our app um, and our website or all the other um, mediums to engage um, and of course when you're at the tennis if you want to order some food you can do that online or you can also um, do it face to face so you're in and out of that um, digital and physical end to end you leave the precinct and of course you might go home and obviously watch it um, and stream and enjoy the tennis for the remainder of the, the three weeks of which now it's a, a three-week event Justin we really so certainly launched that this year yeah, yeah, the uh, the extra zones and, and events and stuff around just the actual open is is, is incredible, right? And keep and continues to grow. I, you know, my head hurts, Karen. You've just told all those things that you have to cover because CX is is all of that stuff, right? And so, how how do you and your team, you know, even remotely try and stay across that and and let alone drive it? Yeah, no, and that's a very good point, Justin. We don't own the customer and we don't own the customer experience. Each of the respective teams own that and we're there to support them, provide them with those insights and guide them with the tools, whether that can be journey mapping, understanding where those pain points are and working with them collaboratively. So we don't see that we're a support um, service team, a shared service, but certainly probably that's one of the mistakes I would call out that I probably went too broad, too wide, too early, too quick, wanted mm. to fix everything, throw in COVID, um, so we yep. are certainly in a stage of just trying to really simplify where we can really make that impact. And um, certainly from a, a revenue perspective, we want to make sure that we can be putting the money back into the sport. So where is the best place to really improve that experience? Yep, yep. And, uh, you know, again, one of the slides that we reference uh, for people to download is, is, is the CX journey. And, and I think that's probably one that we could potentially walk people through as I, I very badly get to it. Uh, here it is. Um, you know, th there's obviously a whole step here that you can walk us through potentially to listeners around how this works. Yeah, certainly. And I think when you look at anything like this, nothing's linear and nothing's <laughs> that's right. CX. So that's, that's lesson number one. It's pretty yeah. messy under the hood. Um, and it is really at the start, really aligning, as I mentioned, with the business strategy, but building up all those relationships and certainly your C-suite is critical um, and to get that commitment and understanding and really appreciation for the customer that they're mm. talking about that um, at the uh, at the grass at, well not the grassroots but they're, they're really aware of what the customer is saying yeah um, and Karen, and can i just ask you on that i'm you, sorry i didn't mean to cut you off um how, how do you because you know we know how critical c-suite commitment is to cx how how do you get that commitment like how have you got them on board i've had um during the last seven years um three to four different executives so i suppose it's been i'm not going to say it's um you know been easy yeah um so it's at least you've had a bit of practice <laughs> <laughs> and different different styles and different personalities and it's, it is just working with those different exec team members and also your only senior leadership team of which we've got a very big senior leadership team so it's also working with that coach cohort and building the relationship i'd always say that just go where where you can and where the where there's appetite and readiness for change i wouldn't ever shove it down anyone's throat um mm. people who's listening to this from tennis australia may think i do that but <laughs> hopefully we haven't um and um yeah we've just worked with the people that are willing to to really embrace it Yep, and, and, and obviously there, there is, you know, I would have liked to think a, a pretty broad collective right across your C-suite anyway around growing the game and everyone's bought into that vision, which is a, a great start, starting place, right? Because a lot of organisations don't even have that. No, no. Oh, no, we've got an amazing exec. And I think, um, you know, in particular, I mean, Craig obviously drives it. He's so fan focused. He's so player focused. So very fortunate to be an organisation and also about innovation, continual change um, and continuous improvement. So that really is an appetite, you know, to be allowed to uh, change. Um, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, calling out, you know, even our CFO now, um, 
uh, Katrina, is absolutely amazing to have a CFO who is so customer centric and really understands the business has been uh, fantastic. But I, I don't like now if any of them are listening, they're all fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, all right, so let's go back to this uh, this uh, journey, I guess. So we've, we've covered off that leadership commitment um, and we move into sort of that align and discover phase. Yes, yeah, certainly. And um, yes, yeah, so then we really, what we started to do was really understand, well, what is our maturity? Now, I would say that we're a very immature um, customer experience compared to all the other people that work in CX, whether it's in um, banks or um, insurance companies or utilities or so forth. So, insure, you know, so we're very immature. So we looked at that and we could see that we needed to grow. Um, and then we looked, did some current state mapping and identified that into some key areas constantly doing lots of research and understanding all those pain points. But probably the best part that we did in this stage was really knowing who our customer is. And it was one of those things that four or five years ago, I don't think you could say that we knew who our customer was. We'd talk about them and when I keep saying this, like there's so many people within tennis that are so customer centric in the way that they do and the work that they do, whether they work in coach, whether they work in performance, of course they care about the athlete. But what we've tried to bring in is some methodology and some consistency about how we go about doing that. So that's that's um, probably so, what we've So you achieved. mentioned the, the, the customer, and, and obviously for you, it, it does take many forms. And again, we'll sort of um, put a, a slide up here, but maybe just at a high level, Karen, could you sort of walk mm. through the audience of, of who are your customers? Because, I mean, most of us, I guess, aren't sitting in your shoes. So we're just fans, right? We go to the tennis and we, mm. we watch, etc. But there's clearly a lot more that <laughs> involved than just that. Certainly. And as you can see with this, we've got a little, well, for those that are watching, but we see it as two sides, which is the events and the tennis. Um, and those are those are the people that watch or play, simplistic. And it's not that simplistic, but obviously, yes, you're right. The fan or the patron, the people that are either watching off-site or on-site. And then, of course, we've got our amazing partners um, that support our sport. And then we've got the players, the heroes, which we definitely need. That's on the event side. And then on the uh, participation side, we've got our participants. And they're the people that play the game, but they might be adults, they might be juniors, they might be um, social, and they might be competitive. Then we've got our deliverers, who are the people who are actually our coaches who are delivering the support and our administrators that are really our volunteers, majority of them are volunteers that are running our venues um, around the country. So, which they had both those two, which is the deliverer and administrator, really enable that participant experience. Yep, yep. So they are, they are really super critical. What I haven't mentioned on this wheel, because we, which is so critical, is the workforce. And they underpin that, um, which I talk about, I think later on when we start getting to about that, um, you know, involving, enhancing experience. But the workforce um, are so critical, particularly during the AO or any of our events. Those people really enhance that experience as people arrive and welcome and direct them where to go and find things, as yep. well as the coach who's providing that amazing experience when somebody's, you know, learning the game. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, again, for probably for the majority of us, we think of Tennis Australia and we're probably just thinking the Australian Open, but of course, <laughs> that's just just one part of, of what you do, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, certainly. We, we do have a team that uh, work very hard trying to get more people to play, play the game more often. Um, and um, that's all through our clubs and our coaches. And we've got a field team out there really helping our clubs, um, you know, try to become a lot more professional and welcoming um, to all of the people within their community so that we are even more diverse, which is an opportunity for us, particularly in tennis. Yeah, and, and and I know uh, from sort of going to the Open earlier this year that there's, you know, I don't know if the word is competition, um, but there's some other forms uh, that mm -hmm. to me, to me look a little bit like tennis um, that are starting to emerge on the global stage. And I know that's not necessarily part of your remit, but I know that you're across it. I just thought the Tennis Australia approach to that was actually you know, quite insightful that you're sort of embracing all of those sort of uh, sports that were, yeah, that are now related. Uh, can you, have you got any sort of something you can share on that without putting you on the yeah, spot? No, <laughs> no, certainly. I mean, complementary formats and, and different ways of playing has always been something we're fairly keen to do, but we're certainly, you know, taking that in a big way now, whether that's through pickleball, paddle and, uh, and pop. Um, um, and their alternative formats and um, yep. it, it is certainly globally um, is going off. So, yeah, we want to encourage all people to play, pick up a racket. Um, and even if it means you can go and play it, you know, we, as we know, other sports do that from cricket. You can play on the beach. So, you know, we've also got beach tennis. So, you know, we're open to all forms.
Yeah, yeah, fantastic. I mean, there's obviously some growth in that, and uh, particularly in Europe, it, I think it was pickle or paddle. One of those is is bloody huge, right? And uh, I'd never heard of it until I actually went to the open, and you guys actually had a court. And to show you how embracing you are, you literally had the we were, just happened to be there when the current world champions were playing. So, um, so you can go, wow, you genuinely are actually embracing it. And uh, yeah, I, I thought it was quite insightful. You know, I think our team have done a great job, particularly in the last two years, of really um, showcasing the sport of tennis um, at the AO as well. Yeah, we yeah. We continue to do it all our other events as well as they grow and develop as well. Yeah. It's such as, obviously, the United Cup this year, which is the first time that we launched, which is obviously a women and men's event, um, which is great, a team's event. And... Um, Appropriate to mention on a day which is International Women's Day. I was just about to say that, so you beat me to it. So uh, exactly right, and and you know obviously with the, the women participation in tennis, uh, like is there a percentage? Like is, is it more played by men or women? I, like I honestly wouldn't have a clue because you, obviously from an open perspective, everything's even, prize money, all that sort of stuff, and you know participation in my own social circles, I would have thought it's almost more women than men, but I'm probably horribly wrong. <laughs> Oh, no, not at all. There's certainly a lot of women playing in, in all different circles, but um, I think it, it d does really depend on what age. Um, so within um, Hot Shots, we've got pretty much equal number of girls and boys um, playing, which is our modified game. But then once start playing competition, that's when it does certainly drop off around that 12, 13, 14, which is not uncommon with most sports. Um, yeah. But, yeah, certainly it's a challenge for, for tennis and um, in that competitive side. Um, and then once you get out to um, adults, yes, you could get a little bit more um, even um, but what we're our area of um, really trying to get more people uh, to play or is certainly our coaches um, we don't have as many female coaches so we're right. really um, addressing that yep fantastic all right well uh, we obviously digressed a little bit there sorry for dragging us off topic so I'm gonna get back to your uh, journey and uh, we were sort of we've got through the align and uh, discover sort of phase and we really want to talk about I guess experience design right and how you yeah. manage all of that Yes, yeah, certainly. So with all our experienced designers, we really work through how are we going to operate, you know, this model with the business. So um, there's some projects that we lead, some that we support, some um, we engage and, and others we really encourage other people to or other people within the business to do it yourself. And we provide them support through a portal with certain um, customer centric templates. Um, but what we um, did was we uh, collaboratively worked together what target state mapping and we actually said well, let's work together and what does it look like in a couple of years time four to five years time and and linked it in with um, you know what does that future look like what are the brilliant basics what are the moments that matter and really what does that you know future state look like so we did that for every one of our customer groups collaboratively with the different groups and that really allows us now to know what we're working towards um, and then customer metrics, certainly that's pretty critical. You've got to all know where you're going. So we're constantly um, listening to our customer and then, uh, you know, creating those targets about what we want to achieve, whether that's through customer satisfaction, net promoter scores, engagement scores on our digital platforms, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to lift the bonnet off that one because I have a funny feeling there's probably a lot of interest around what metrics you're using. So you've just reeled off a couple uh, then. Um, uh, how, how, how do you do that? Is it through emails, SMS, are you ringing people? Uh, probably all of the above, but uh, I would love to know a bit more insight around how you actually are getting that feedback. Yeah, certainly. It's um, it's certainly not omni-channel, let's put it that way. And we certainly would love it to be all coming through into the one source and, and being able to synthesise it that way. What we have got, especially during the Australian Open, we use um, our little process we call um, listen, um, act and uh, improve. So through the listening, there are around six to seven different ways that we're listening. Each day was around 10,000 data points that wow. we were allowed uh, enable us to then um, you know really hear what those themes are that's from our customer support team our customer experience ambassadors on the ground and we use um, an external agency to help us with that research as well that's coming in off the back of everybody being to the AO so it's a combination of people surveys our customer support and using our app as well um, with getting feedback so um, we started to use a, a tool to assist us with you know getting all that unstructured data to help us with the themes but um, yeah we like to do that in real time so that we can be really making those changes right then and now to improve that experience whether it's on the ground um, or digitally um, that day next day or for the next year 
Yep. So if you've got a team that's, uh, if I'm at the Australian Open and I'm, I don't know, complaining about something because uh, customers love to complain about anything. So I'm complaining about maybe the queues or uh, I can't find somewhere to get some water or whatever it might be. Uh, your team are actively looking, listening, and then taking action to, to close that loop effectively. Yeah, we encar- really empower them to do that right then and there at the spot. And I, if I give you an example, certainly if someone's in the arena and they're not happy with their seat, we don't want to hear about it the next day. We mm-hmm. can't fix it. So we really want them to tell the services team right then and there that they can't see, maybe obstructed, that wasn't wasn't what they expected, and we can address that right then and there. Um, but other times, obviously, people are calling our customer support team, which is afterwards, but the customer experience team on the ground can really be um, impacting and improving those experiences for that customer there. Yep. Right and, for, the and for the support team, Casey, how, how do, um, you know, obviously this guy sitting in the, in the call center effectively, uh, call comes through. How, how does the call center then get that information back to, to the CX team, if you like, to then take action? Yeah, totally. yeah so pretty much it's pretty um, tedious how we go about doing it. But literally every day our teams meet um, and then we centralize that. And then this year what we did, we had a meeting which we had a representative from each of those seven different sources. And we literally looked at what the current pain points were. Now this year oh, it was amazing. There wasn't near as many as previous years, but um, we then collaboratively work out like and prioritise them. What are the ones with the biggest impact? How can we address them right then and there? Um, and so we would literally delegate and say, okay, could you go and fix that? And we had representatives from Delaware, um, we had representatives from Melbourne Olympic Park and representatives also obviously from all those other teams. So um, it's a team effort. Yeah, fantastic. Well, and without airing uh, all all of your dirty laundry, Karen, like what what are some of the common uh, like complaints that you you tend to see year to year that um, I, I guess are difficult to to shut down. Um, I think ticketing is probably our biggest challenge and that would be the same with any event across the globe. Um, it's a real challenge and, and particularly with, you know, at that identity profile and then being able to then forward on, forward on tickets and, and being able to navigate that and popping it in your app and your wallet. Um, we're still all trying to get used to that. And then, you know, so, and sometimes people purchase on behalf of other people, particularly in tennis because you're buying in groups. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, there's so many different sessions and times. And um, so that would be probably our number one. Um, area would be ticketing and yep. we're obviously constantly always improving what that experience is yeah and, and i'm assuming you, you you don't run the ticketing yourself as in you work with a ticketing partner that would manage all that we do um we work with Ticketmaster or ticket tech and um, we obviously work closely with them um particularly obviously ticket master for the australian open and um yeah but our teams work on those journeys end to end and then work through where are those areas that we can improve within that user experience um so fantastic uh, and in terms of those metrics um how often oh, you said daily obviously during the open you're, you're right on it so you can take action straight away but you know it's outside of that three-week period when it's probably just mm. utter chaos uh you know, how often are you looking at things then because obviously we're really then talking about just participation and other i guess you know events you've got going on around the state is it monthly weekly you know annual <laughs> It, it really does depend on what group we're talking about. So we do do, uh, I think, a quarterly survey with our clubs and our coaches um, and get that feedback. And that's also customer satisfaction and net promoter scores. And that then they work through that on a regular basis. Um, and in terms of other areas in tennis, we obviously have a customer effort score and customer support. But um, yeah, there's lots of other metrics, but specifically CX, we're probably, they're the two main ones that we really focus on. Yep. Okay. Understand. And um, as you said, at the moment, you know, I think we, some of us all would love to live in a world where everything just comes in and it's all looking pretty in dashboards and you get to manage anything. The reality is you're just using so many different sources. It's just, it, it is probably hard getting across all of that, right? Certainly. And I mean, you know, just one area we actually didn't mention, which is obviously court hire, which is, you know, just um, in mm-hmm blowing us out of the water which is fantastic which allows people just to go and book a court online and um, then you can get a pin and you can go down to the court and use that pin to get into the courts now that's a lot better than what it used to be um, where you had to go and knock on a kiosk and get a key from either someone's house or the local shop and then get in and so forth so that yep. has really increased accessibility which we're you know really proud to have done um, but certainly um, we've got metrics that we're using from that on a you know a daily basis and the team are working really hard on that um, particularly and that would be the same in each of the areas whether that's in the competitive play area tournaments match play and so forth 
Yeah, fantastic. I, I, I know you touched on it earlier and I, I probably didn't sort of give it the, the due credit or recognition it deserves, but I really like your approach around seeing yourselves as, I guess, a support services kind of uh, area and not telling everyone how to suck eggs, but actually empowering the rest of your business uh, by giving them better insights and tools, etc., around the customer. I actually think that's quite a unique approach. How, how did that evolve? Um, I just think it's a philosophy that ultimately there are so many different customers and so many different journeys that they're a small team that we've got. We couldn't say that we owned customer experience. So, um, and I think I probably learned that from some of my mentors and, and listening to others that ultimately, yeah, it's, it's the journey that's, um, we've got subject matter experts who are designing the precinct um, and they're designing that. So, and what's great is that they're really listening to what our insights are. They hear that we need shade. They hear that we need more seating and they hear that we, you know, uh, they want to be connected. And, um, and, you know, so they are designing those experiences. So that's an example of how we've now embedded some of our experience designers within that team. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so yeah. Great, great example of, of sort of how it all works. So thank you for sharing that. Now we're gonna get back to your journey. Uh, apologies, we keep, we could just talk for hours, Karen, couldn't we? So um, <laughs> we're gonna go back here to uh, to your experience. Uh, we've talked about design, and uh, but now in terms of experience activation and what does that actually mean? Yeah, certainly. And it's funny, you say we could talk for hours, but there might not be anyone listening. But that's <laughs> <laughs> um, but <laughs> in terms of, um, yeah, so I think that's where we're at, but we've still got a long way to go in terms of this inspire, amplify and embed process. So um, in terms of where we're at at the moment, we're really trying to embed this in, this, in the culture, um, customer centricity. So for example, we've embedded team members like within that team. Um, so I, you know, I think let's see how that goes over the next couple of years and now we're at that stage of really um, working on our CRM as well so that we can start to personalize our experiences at the moment we don't really have the ability to personalize our experiences as much as we really would like to so that's our next phase and that will be a long journey um, and then I mentioned earlier I think we talked about our market segmentations so we've you know really tried to understand our customers their behaviors their, um, their needs and their wants and really design experiences for each of those segments. Um, and so we're going to do that end to end and really be quite disciplined. So we've got team members that are really leading that and we're working with them to support them along that, um, uh, that journey that we're on. Our journey, but also, of course, our customer's journey. Yep, yep, understand. Um, you, know, you mentioned human-centered design, and we touched on it in the start, um, and really embedding that customer-centric culture. Um, part of that obviously is you sharing data and information and, and I guess educating the broader business around the importance of customer experience and hopefully people are listening to this podcast I don't need to convince them of the importance of customer experience. You've hopefully ticked that box already. Um, but um, talk to me about how, how you go about embedding you know, that, that culture because it's not always easy to do. Yeah, no, agreed. And um, it, once again, it probably hasn't been textbook. Um, it's certainly been go where the energy is um, and where that appetite is for that change. What we did do, we were very fortunate to have some funding to set up a program which we called the Tennis Front Door. And it was an opportunity to run a project for three months focused on a how might we statement, which was how might we get um, more social plays um, for a better digital, for an exceptional digital experience. And that is actually now what's turned into our book a court um, program right. and, and court hire. Um, and that's still got a long way to go and more opportunities to really create that as a better experience, but it's on the way. And um, so we use that as our, our burning platform to start because we knew based on insights that there was an opportunity to grow the game in that space. Um, and there was certainly, um, we could see that we had clubs and coaches and we needed a platform to support and we needed a front door. Um, and that's literally what we've got now is a website. For anyone who does want to check it out, who's listening, it's uh, play.tennis.com.au. And, um, and you can see that's a, a way which is, you know, a, um, that you can play tennis um, through booking a court or open court sessions or cardio tennis. Um, and where was I going? I think I've even lost where we were going with that question. <laughs> Human-centered design and changing the culture. Thank you. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so thank you. I went down a little cul-de-sac there. But yeah, so what we did do is then we created a, um, that 
that three month project was an opportunity to uplift and for everyone to understand what human centered design was, including myself. Um, so what we did for during that project, we obviously came to the end of it, um, did a lot of research in front of our customers. And we did that using um, and I think you just had it up there, the double diamond um, to go through that process. But what was exciting? I well, I enjoyed during this process that we brought around 200 people in the business through our um, what you'd call our hub at the time of where they were working. So we had a joint team from Deloitte and Tennis Australia and collaboratively worked together. So we uplift our people within the business um, and also expose them to this approach. Um, and if you want to just pop that up again, but in terms of um, just for, for our, those that are watching, so it pretty much most people be listening may be aware of the double diamond but it's about building the right thing and building things right and going through that process of discovering defining designing and delivering and you take your customer along the journey so we certainly did that over a 12-week project um, explained that to the business and then we now are using that in all our projects and um, you can see that this process is not linear it's not always done um, as simply as that, but it is a very iterative process. But certainly in the discover phase, it's about understanding everything you know about that customer, whether that's current insights that you've got, whether you need to go out and get some more data points, and then you map that, and then you start defining and understanding, and you go through that process. It's a, it's a fundamental process to, to CX, and uh, as we touched on, people can see the Tennis Australia model that Karen's referring to on the website. There's also a template that you can actually download uh, with that process as well. So if you're sort of going, I want to see it from scratch, uh, you can download the template. If you want to see exactly how they're doing at Tennis Australia, you can download that slide as well, right? So how good is this? Um, all right, so Karen, um, I, I guess back to, to the other slide that we were, we we're talking around. Uh, and I'm just going to scroll back here while I was on it. Uh, it was around the activation process, uh, and we're talking about the centricity and and embedding that culture. Um, but y your sort of next phase in your journey is, I, I guess, around that amplify and embed. So can you walk us through how that works in your business? Yeah, well, and I say I think that's where we're really at at that stage, and this is like an ongoing process where we work with the business and align it. With, it's continually as our strategy evolves. We're mm. making sure that we're aligning our strategy and our structure to support those people. So, for example, we now have a new strategy within the participation side called Game On, and we're aligning a team or a, some capability along to support uh, the participation team. And now we've got a uh, fit for growth in the revenue side of the business, and that's certainly around um, growing the Australian Open and our events. So same thing, we're aligning and readjusting all the time to make sure that we embed it with each of those roadmaps. Same with the digital roadmap, we're working through what that is and we'll apply and, and um, put capability um, aligned to those key projects, which yeah, can be the AO web, AO app, our CRM, um, and so forth. And digital is just that space it is moving at just such a frenetic pace at the moment. And, and now, obviously, we're, you know, we're talking around the metaverse and all these sorts of things that are starting to emerge as well, right? So, bloody hell, I'm still getting my head around how to get an IVR right with press one for this, two for that. And we're talking about the metaverse. So, it's a, oh, geez. Um, now, Karen, I, what I did before I thought I'd uh, sit down and do an interview with you, I went out to some of the AXPA board members and I said, hey, I'm catching up with Karen for a podcast. And I thought, has anyone got any questions that they would like to ask? Karen now I'm not going to run through uh, all of those questions because they literally got heaps but uh, if you're okay I'd love to just sort of fire a few at you that I think might be of interest um, to our audience certainly go for it awesome um, now that one question just related to uh, and I guess this is really in particular to the actual event itself um, that you do get such a diverse range of uh, ethnicities and backgrounds that come to the tennis right people people literally go all around the world right and go to different opens etc and not everyone speaks english etc so how from a cx perspective uh to try and help and and, and i guess uh ensure they have an equally great experience mm, no no it's great and, and obviously over the last two years we haven't had that um and, and, and not as many even this year obviously and i think certainly next year international will be a greater focus but certainly mm. we encourage 
all walks of life. Everybody would come, obviously, to the Australian Open because, of course, all our players come from about, you know, 70 to 80 different countries. So, wow. of course, we want all those people to, to come and watch. So, um, especially we have teams that we encourage people who can speak another language um, or other languages and we obviously promote that through their um, name tags and um, obviously working towards our websites um, also being in other languages as well and um, and of course from the player side of things which is obviously one of our really key um, segments and audiences or is is looking after the players and of course much of our player services team can speak um, you know multiple languages so um, they can support the players and make sure that they are really enjoying um, the Australian Open. Yep, and, and it's funny, isn't it? Like as much as technology evolves and we spend can spend literally millions on all sorts of uh, platforms, something simple like having a name badge that says, I also speak, you know, Mandarin or whatever is can be just as effective, if not more than all these other million dollar technology solutions, right? <laughs> Well, I think um, it's something in terms of the customer experience, which we talk about, is it's the people all the way through the experience. We talk digital and tech and the brand, but we can't forget the people. And I think it um, doesn't matter where you are, I still personally like to chat to a person. Um, if, and specifically at an event such as the Australian Open, I know I keep referring to the Australian Open, but it obviously is our marquee event. But in terms of it's hot, um, often there's a lot of people and you can't actually find, your, you know, to pull out your phone, you can't see the screen. So there is um, benefits of actually True. a real human being able to direct you, especially if you need to go to the bathroom quite quickly. Yeah, and, and you know, as I said, from walking around, they, they were very visible. I can't remember exactly what they were wearing, but I remember they were very easy to spot. It was, and, and not only that, and I don't know how you, you train for this, or maybe you don't, or maybe you just recruited really well, Karen, but I also found um, for a lot of the people, I called you Karen, I should have said KC. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of the people, I was like, whack. Um, but, but they're also very approachable, you know, so you can get people, you can give them the right T-shirt, you can do all that sort of stuff. But if they look like they're you know, in a foul mood or not actually looking to make eye contact, it's hard to engage. But I didn't get that from your people. Is, is that, as I said, is it good luck? Is it good training? Is it good recruitment? I'd like to think it's really good training, Justin, because that's something we're <laughs> responsible for. But um, look, you know what? I think we have... You know, we're very fortunate to have great people. One at Tennis Australia that I work with full time are amazing. Everybody I work with, and that's why I have, probably haven't left because people are amazing. But so are our people that we recruit for the Australian Open. I was chatting to our um, director of people and culture yesterday, and I think there was uh, a 74 percent return rate. Um, this year and previous years it was about 84 percent so prior to COVID we've obviously lost a little bit there but yep. um it's amazing the fact that they love it so much and that's why we are so well known as this friendly slam and we need people to when we do that in our training be yourself be authentic and um and that's what you're here to do because that's what the australian way is and that's why people do love coming to the australian open particularly our international Yep. And, and again, I probably should have covered this right at the start. Jeez, I'm, I'm just crap on this interview thing. But uh, um, I, I'd like to think I'm a CX professional, but I'm not actually a, a proper podcaster, as people can tell, right? So I jump all over the place. So apologies. But um, you do have some CX principles. Um, and I should have asked you that right up front, because those three principles, I actually think you just sort of answered in what you just do then but um i've got the the slide to, to share with everyone but those principles are, are i thought were really good <laughs> and look look these aren't rocket science and i actually think everything that we do in, in cx some isn't rocket science but it's the fact that it's putting it all together and we collaboratively have worked through these with many other people and our stakeholders but it is about easy and that means certainly easy to join online easy as you walk in through the entrance, um, easy to, to hopefully get food and beverage, and we know we need to work on that. Making it personal, and whether that's once again physical, or whether we can hopefully um, really making that a personal experience online as well, mm. and memorable. And the memorable one connects with actually what our training is, which we encourage all our training to be, um, which is make it memorable. Um, and that is greet with a smile, know your stuff, and be one step ahead. And that's about connection, um, consistency, and curiosity, the three C's. Yeah, fantastic. There's a, there's, there's a body of work behind how we develop that program. But you know what? In three weeks, if they can remember those three C's or those three things, that's probably all we really need them to do and just be themselves. 
Yeah, no, well done. As I said, it doesn't always have to be rocket science. So I think sometimes keeping it simple, uh, the old KISS methodology actually has some merit, right? So uh, um, now a lot of the questions that I got submitted uh, related to metrics, I think everyone's sort of grappling with the right metrics to, to use, to look at, etc. cetera. Um, and I know that you did uh, submit a slide that just does give us some insight, I guess, into some of your results which and some of the metrics. So uh, again, if you could just maybe just walk us through at a high level uh, some of those metrics and, and what you're actually have achieved because they're incredibly impressive. Yes, yeah, certainly. And if you've got them up on the screen, that will help. Thank, thank you. Um, but in terms of that, in, well, I think one of our you know best ones from the Australian Open is that our premium experience purchasing and sales has grown 400%, um, which has been amazing since it's gone online. And we've been, and the team did map it end to end. And then obviously now they've it, worked with the team to the premium experience team to execute that and of course the digital team and the ticketing team as well so everything and and marketing so it's a collaborative effort to get yep. to that achievement okay so 400 percent um, growth obviously is amazing but just for a premium experience can you just explain to us uh, what what's what what's is? a yeah what's a premium experience as opposed to <laughs> the normal experience yeah <laughs> certainly so it's an opportunity to to purchase a restaurant as well as ticketing um and there are some great experiences whether it might be you know uh, booking at Rockpool and or Founders Club, or it might be an opportunity to um, go to um, Penfolds and and have a beautiful meal, three three courses, sit down in a really great space, and um, and then you can go and watch the tennis and you can enjoy that with your friends, family, clients. Um, there were some very impressive setups, I've got to say, uh, as uh, we got to have a bit of a squeeze there, and uh, and they're just temporary setups, right? I mean, they're literally just there for the few weeks and they're they're gone again, right? Yeah, our team do an amazing job to design those experiences and work with those um, external suppliers. And yeah, the food and beverage that they put on is um, is amazing experience. So yeah, for any of those people that haven't come down to enjoy the Australian Open, um, get on it and you can actually book now um, those experiences. Wow, there um, you go. Look now, all right. So get on for, for 20, what are we at? 2024 already. Okay. 2024, yep. Wow. And you can, yep get involved um, now but of course we, you know our, our customer satisfaction has increased as well from 8 8.7 which you know we're ecstatic with that with obviously record crowds and our customer satisfaction um, going up we're, we're super happy um, with how we've gone about doing that and addressing you know the crowds and the, the queue management um, online food sorry ordering. Chris so I'm going to interrupt you again um, I have to okay, ask sorry. lots of questions but 8.7 is, is fantastic and back in 2020 it was 8.2 so you can see that it's, it's gone up every year right so that's testament to to you and your team doing a, a fantastic job uh, how, how do you how do you measure that customer satisfaction though is, is that done through a one particular survey or are you bringing in lots of different data and that's a you know cumulative score or how is that actually done yeah, we the main reason we use this is this is through our survey that um, actually goes out to all the people who are our customers or patrons who have attended the event. Right. And but we get an amazing uh, response rate. Um, you know, it's about ten percent of the people that attended the Australian Open. So yeah. fantastic, well done, awesome, thank you. Sorry, I just thought that was important to clarify. No, that's all right. Um, obviously, we've launched the online food ordering, um, and that certainly has increased the transactions. Um, you know, average transactions. Is that and, in um, is that in like I'm sitting in my seat and ordering. Is that what you mean? Not by that? quite. Okay. We can do that for our founders. So if you'd like to join the founders club, um, you can get that. I'm thinking I need a pay rise to join that founders club, uh, Casey. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to try. Yes, and it is quite. A, it's, a, it's a great experience, and that's certainly our top-notch one. But yes, you do need to delve into your pockets to okay. enjoy that yeah. experience. I'll take your um, word for it. No, <laughs> but there's uh, an opportunity um, to uh, for online food ordering. Just know while you're actually at the event um, and just you can just you don't actually skip the queue but it just means you don't have to stand in the queue um but yeah that's um certainly oh, got it. So, so i could be you know watching on the big screen just sitting on a chair and instead of going and lining up at the window i can just order from you're sitting on the yep. lawn or whatever stay, in, stay in your bean bag chill out and then you'll get the ping and then you can go up there um, yeah awesome so, yeah and the other thing that we've introduced is the virtual queue um so same thing going back for three years ago um when we had crowds in 2020, um, there were crowds and crowds around um, John Kane Arena, uh, which might have been called High Sensor Arena then potentially. And um, so, yeah, people would queue for literally three hours to go into the arena. So now we've introduced a virtual queue. Um, so, literally, it means, yep, I can uh, book in through a QR code at the door, and then you can go away and enjoy the venue. Um, watch tennis in the Grand Slam Oval, um, do some shopping, and then you'll get a ping when it's your turn to come back um, and there's a seat available. Yep, great. 
Um, yeah, and certainly our ticketing experience has, has increased our customer satisfaction, which is great and a testament to the team. Um, I'm mindful of um, how much detail I'll go in here, but I have also, I just touch on a couple of the participation. And so year on year, our online court hire has increased by 43% and increased traffic to that website that I mentioned before, which is 605% increase wow. to playtennis.com.au. Um, and certainly that is bringing in more revenue to our clubs um, all around Australia who are offering that service, uh, which is great. And also great for our coaches um, with increased uh, bookings um, for their coaches as well. So, yeah. no, we're super happy with what's going on on both sides of the business on the events and participation with growing more people watching and more people playing. Wow, fantastic. Um, I, I guess finally, the, the, the question I'll, I'll throw at you is, is just, you know, we, we obviously, you know, as we've said, it's not linear in CX, right? We're always jumping around and moving things. But uh, in terms of, you know, upcoming customer experience, Experience initiatives or changes that, um, that you're looking to implement in the near future. Uh, obviously, one we, we, we touched on a little bit earlier is extending, you know, the tennis open. It's not just a, you know, the event. There's some stuff outside of that. But what are some of the other things? If you're happy to share of the things that you're working on. Yeah, well, I think certainly now we've got a very clear strategy. We're going to be really super disciplined about really where where things go within the precinct and designing the precinct for the Australian Open specifically and yep. really targeting that around our segments now that we're becoming a little bit more mature around those segments. Um, extending the Open over those three weeks. We only had a dabble at that this year, but we really want to make Welcome Week um, you know, a great opportunity to get closer to the players um, who are qualifying. And there's some great practice matches and, you know, that was... So um, really successful um, where people really enjoyed um, watching practice. Um, if I go back to my tennis experience, I remember what John Newcomb um, practice at, at Kuyong and I've had this conversation with John and he certainly inspired me um, for the love of the game and um, and I think that's why I have this um, you know motivation to encourage all people to enjoy watching but particularly our families and kids because they can then get a desire of a love of the, of the game of tennis which you know that's a great thing. So um, I've talked about the precinct talk, and probably digital experience would be our other area that we're really trying to double down. How do we really improve, um, particularly for the app, for the AO app? Um, how do we improve that experience on site? How do you plan your day? Um, we launched a, a proof of concept this year, a minimal viable product for planning your day and we'll build on that. Um, and we know that one in two of our patrons actually use um, the plan your day, whether it's on our app or a web. So that's an opportunity to really uh, make sure that they get the most out of their day at AO. On the tennis side of the business, certainly we're improving that court hire business, the competitive play experience um, and the hot shots journey. Yep, yep. Um, fantastic. Well, wow, there's lots going on. So you're never going to have a dull day, that's for sure, uh, KC. And uh, I, as I said, I, I was amazing to me just how much work goes on. Not just in, It's not just in that three-week period. Obviously, that's almost the culmination of all the hard work that you've done throughout the year. So, um, yeah, congratulations on, on everything, AO. As you said, those results speak volumes uh, for just you know how well that you and your broader team are working with the rest of your business to improve the overall experience for everyone across the game. So uh, very very grateful for you uh, giving up some of your time and insights and experience in sharing that with uh, our audience. I know we uh, said we might sort of do a couple more and drill in to a couple of things in a bit more detail. So if those are sort of would love to know a little bit more about a particular thing, stay tuned. We'll uh, we'll do a couple more podcasts with KC in the future. Um, but for now, um, KC, thank you so much for uh, giving up all of your time again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Justin. And we'll speak to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Bye now.